During the 1940s, another designer, Claire McCurdell, became known for creating the American look. Like Hawes, McCurdell was a talented fashion designer and provided American women with well-made and smart-looking casual ready-to-wear clothes. From the 1930s to 1950s, she was known for designing functional, affordable, and stylish clothing. Her American look played on wartime patriotism, and her 1942 popover dress was an inexpensive, attractive denim wraparound dress that women could move in easily while they did the additional work that war brought into their lives. Most American designers at this time were virtually anonymous, but McCardell was a knowledge for her designs and her clothes were sold at prestigious department stores. Because millions of men went into the military during World War II, some women were able to reach executive levels of employment. Lord and Taylor's Dorothy Shaver was one of them. Initially hired in the 1920s to work for the company's comparison bureau, the main function of which was to spy on other stores, Shaver was elected Lord and Taylor's first female president in 1945. The company was the first major store on Fifth Avenue to appoint a woman to the top position. Department stores such as Lord and Taylor, Macy's, and Woodward and Lothrop played enormously important roles in the relationship between the fashion industry and marketing to the female consumer. The department stores were for and about women. Most of the things that were sold in the stores are, are either clothing for women and you start getting ready-made clothing in the post-Civil War period slowly, or there's material, or there's, there's millinery, there's sewing goods, there's all sorts of things for the woman and for the household. There are men's clothes as well, but they are a secondary thought, they're a minor thought in these department stores. And men usually had a separate entrance and the men's department was usually separate so that men didn't have to go through the women's department. Department stores were designed to bring several types of goods under the same roof. And more importantly, adding tea rooms, lunch counters, and other comforts were done to make shopping more pleasant. Trying on ready-made fashions could be much more fun than fittings with a seamstress or milliner who might or might not know anything about current style. And shopping became an important part of social life, especially for urban and middle-class women. Some historians see urban department stores as having started, or the, the progenitors of urban department stores as having started even before the Civil War. But pretty much everybody agrees that the heyday of the American department store um, began in about the 1870s and 1880s when in American cities of all sizes department stores emerged and uh, promoted urban shopping of a kind that really had not been seen before. They offered for their customers uh, um, what one historian has called dream worlds, really uh, uh, displays full of light and color. They, they had concerts, they had childcare, they had post offices. So, I mean, it was not only, it was, it was services they were offering and also entertainment that they were offering that made it fun to go shopping. They had lunch rooms, they had restaurants, they had both fancy and not so fancy places where you could stop and eat while you were doing your shopping. And um, what this meant was that for women, uh, especially middle and upper class women, but actually the department stores fairly early offered opportunities even for poorer women to shop, even though they tried to keep the poorer women and the richer women away from each other. The basement um, gave an opportunity for uh, women who didn't have the money to be shopping on the upper floors to come into the department store and participate in the activity of shopping. Most modern department stores of the 20th century wanted to wield style authority and after World War II stores appealing to the upper class widened the distance between themselves and discount stores. In addition to eye-popping window and interior displays, they relied on fashion shows, fashion magazines, and visits from designers to keep the public aware of their fashion stance. The Ladies' Mile in New York City is emblematic of this new 
consumer culture that takes hold of the city. And Ladies Mile ran from 14th Street to 23rd Street on 6th Avenue. And on Ladies Mile was a host of stores. There were about eight different stores. Most names don't exist anymore, except for Lord & Taylor, which was on Ladies Mile before it moved to fifth, its present location on 5th Avenue. And the atmosphere of Ladies Mile was intoxicating. The, the number of things one could buy, the number of places one could buy them in, was quite remarkable. The new merchandising methods aimed at women led inevitably to the employment of more female clerks. And though these jobs were almost always low paying and seldom led to the executive suite, they were nonetheless jobs that had not been available to women a century earlier. The jobs for women were, were mostly in the sales position. There were some women managers, there were certainly women buyers. The jobs for women opened up on a number of levels. Most of them were for working class girls, and they were girls, and they were white. And, but there were a secondary level of both managers and buyers in the department stores that um, suddenly gave work to women who were on the cusp of the middle class or in the, in the middle class. The fashion industry is a big and glamorous business, and American women have lent their talents to its development, whether through design, sewing, marketing, or shopping. The thing about fashion is, fashion's all about change. And the thing about history is, it too is all about change.